Thank you for joining the online ministry of New Life Fellowship. May you be blessed by the Word of God. I'd like to read from the book of Genesis, chapter 30. And I'll start with verse 25. We'll just read a few verses together. Here we go. Verse 25. And Rachel gave birth to Joseph. Jacob said to Laban, send me on my way so I can go back to my own homeland. So Jacob and Rachel had a baby named Joseph. Jacob says to Laban, his father-in-law, send me back so I can go to my own husband. Give me my wives and children for whom I have served you. This is many years now in the making. I'll be on my way. You know how much work I've done for you. But Laban said, if I've found favor in your eyes, please stay. I've learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Verse 35. That same day, he removed all the male goats that were streaked and spotted and all the speckled and spotted female goats. All that had white on them, all the dark colored lambs, and he placed them in the care of his sons. Then he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob while Jacob continued to tend the rest of Laban's flocks. So on this Easter Sunday morning, I want to talk to you about a three-day journey. Amen. I thank you, Lord, for all the people. I pray your blessing upon everyone that hears this word. I pray for all the families that are represented, Lord Jesus. Cover them. Keep them. Help us. We desperately need you today. We lift you up here in this house, Lord. We know that you are our Lord, our resurrected Savior. I praise you and give you glory. All of the praise, all of the glory belongs to you. And I pray every prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone said in Jesus' name. Turn to someone close by and tell them that uh, they're the best looking person you've seen today. And then you may be seated. Don't, don't lie. Just say the day's not over. I suppose when there's not much to be gained, very few people are interested. If there's not much to be had, um, not everyone cares. But if there is a wave of success happening somewhere, People show up, maybe to be connected. The lottery winner suddenly has a lot of friends. People that were his friends are now his family. People that he barely knew now are lifelong buddies. Such is the case in Genesis chapter 30, Jacob was blessed, so very blessed, because God had made a promise to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. 
And while Jacob had very little to do with his own blessing that he was receiving, his father-in-law, Laban, knew that everything Jacob touched seemed to prosper. Laban might not have held the blessing, but he knew that as long as he was connected to Jacob, he would receive part of that blessing even if it was vicariously through Jacob. He had really no connection to Abraham and distant family member, but it was Jacob that now held all the blessing and the covenant. Had Jacob been poor, had the reality of, of um, prosperity and help, and had it not been present, I submit that Laban would have cared nothing for Jacob. Had Jacob struggled in life or had he been found wanting, Laban and the in-laws would have just dismissed him, soundly dismissed him. But God had given a promise and the covenant that God made with Abraham had been passed from Abraham to Isaac and now to Jacob. When there is gain, of course, when there is this prosperity, of course, people become interested, and such is the case. This transfer of blessing that came from Abraham and now to Jacob, this transfer of blessing, it had caused Laban, this man, to want to stay connected to that somehow intangible but real blessing that God was giving and in this moment, it seemed that whatever Jacob touched turned in his favor. We know that it was the Lord that was blessing him, that it was God's blessing. His father-in-law may not have known to the full extent of how it came to be or why it was taking place. But Laban knew, I've got to keep Jacob around because when he's here, things are going well. So it is no wonder why he would have wanted Jacob to live close, to stay close. But of course, as the years go by and the herds of sheep and goat are growing, something had to be done. Jealousy and strife became the family wedge. Money does that to people, regardless of any era. There are wedges of strife. So Jacob decided to make an agreement with his father-in-law to separate the herds of goats and sheep. And they did so by blemish. Jacob said to his now very greedy father-in-law, he said, why don't you take all the pure white goats and I'll take all the spotted and striped ones. And they did that, but even that was not really enough. There had to be a physical separation. The herds of sheep and goat were too great to occupy the same place. And the workers were complaining all the time, all of which made Laban more suspicious of Jacob. So to draw the line of ownership, to draw the line of ownership, Laban proposed this. We will put a three-day journey between us. We need to establish ownership and three days will be just the right amount of distance that will, it will signify and help us to signify possession. What I possess and what you possess will be separated by three days. Laban wanted to keep what was his and the feeling was mutual with Jacob. Both men needed to establish their own holdings. Both men understood that it was more than just a herd of goats and sheep, but inheritance was at stake. And then the rights of titles would come into play. Their children and grandchildren and name recognition came to the one with such wealth. Abraham himself was known in the same way in his day. Solomon also, a host of other people. They were known by their possessions. So Jacob and Laban came to this understanding a three-day journey made it so that there was no questions as to the rightful owner of the goats and the sheep. Not just time, 
It wasn't just distance, but the rightful owner was about to be established and it was marked by a three-day journey. And this was not the first time in the scripture that three days became the definition of ownership, but it would, but it would, it would and it was, it was not the first time, it won't be the last. Here is what the Hebrew scholars write, which comes from those writers and then from the Mishnah. I quote, as it is in the Mishnah, the term three days journey serves in the temple scroll as an idiom to describe territorial boundaries. It meant property and possession rights. It was more than just walking for three days. It was more than just time. It implied a place of separation, wherein a transfer of goods, control, titles, and ownership could take place. A three-day journey made it so that there was no question as to the rightful owner of the possession. Three days was the space it took to convey the rights from one to another. One person can lose their right and another person could gain that right and that space of time. That makes me happy. If we look at the moment that Moses went before Pharaoh, we have to note that the conversation that he had with Pharaoh was more than just a petition to let my people go. The fact is that Moses did not ask Pharaoh just to set them free. That was not his only request, although I think that that was the majority of the conversation. Moses did not approach the Pharaoh of Egypt and simply say, let all the people go. No, Moses went to the palace and said, look at all these plagues wrought on your people on the land of Egypt. Look at all the torment that you brought. Here's what we want, Exodus 8, 27. We will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. I mean, pray for me. Take this plague away. Pharaoh said, you can go, but not that far. Yes, you can go make a sacrifice. Just don't go very far away to do it. Have your religious moment if you wish, but a three-day journey is too far for you to travel. I'll lose my power if you get to the third day. I'll lose my grip over you if you walk three days away because ownership is on the line. Three days away will mean that Pharaoh will not be the Lord over them. He won't be able to dictate their lives. Imprisonment can be lost on the third day. Pharaoh knows it. Worship any way you want. Do whatever you like, but stay within the boundaries of my domain. Three days was just too much time and too much distance. He would lose his possession of the people. Now scroll ahead in your Bible, and you're going to find a man named Joshua. He was the successor of Moses. He's preparing to fight against this fortified city called Jericho. It had massive walls, and no one could get through those impenetrable walls. Two spies were sent into that fortified city to review the layout. They were scoping out the land. They were there on behalf of Joshua to see what the armies of Israel might face. Where are the exits and, and what's there? And, and, and maybe wh where is their armament? But in their moment, they were seen. People saw them. They, they took note that these were strange men in the city of Jericho. And the news came that the men of Israel were in the city. People found out. That's when Rahab gave this advice to those two men, the spies. She said, the men of the city, they're after you. They want to kill you. They know that you are here. I'll read from the Bible. Joshua 2, 16. Now she had said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and then go on your way because the enemy that is against you, he will give up. They will give up in three days. Your enemy knows that after three days, it's no use. They'll turn away from you. Rahab, Rahab said, those who pursue you will give up and they'll return back home and you'll be out of reach on the third day. 
This, ladies and gentlemen, is Resurrection Sunday. I'm not here to su surprise you. I just want to show you the extent that Jesus went to set us free. And we are free today indeed. Yes, we are free. Thank God we are free. Thank God we are free. He did not simply heal all of our physical sicknesses. I'm glad that he did that, and I'm glad that he will. And I'm thankful for his healing touch. I'm grateful that he has the power over illness, sickness, and disease. But there is a healing of the heart that is far greater than the cumulative medical problems combined. Heaven is a real place, and Jesus said it this way. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I stand here to say that resurrected Jesus has been preparing a place for us, and at the moment of the sound of the trumpet, the dead in Christ are going to rise, and then everybody who's been set free. Time meant both distance and authority. It was a length that was set as a precedent long before Jesus came to be, long before he walked on the earth, long before the commencement of the New Testament. Jesus could have stayed in the grave one single day, and that would have been enough. If he just went to the grave one day and rose again, it would have been enough for all of us. Matthew 26 67 said that they did spit on his face. They buffeted him. They smote him with their palms. They said, prophesy unto us, thou Christ. Who is it that hit you in the face? Who smote thee? And they beat the Lord with their fist. They dragged him down the side of the mountain. And all the way abusing him. And when they, when they arrived, they finally cast him into a pit. And then they dragged him to the streets of Jerusalem to the house of the high priest Caiaphas and then off to Pilate and then, and then to Herod and then back to Pilate. And then Pilate tried to reason with the Pharisees. He knew something was wrong, but they threatened a citywide revolt which would place Pilate in the crosshairs of Rome. So the Bible says, Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, the Roman soldier, he had crafted his trade very well. And he took this already depleted Jesus of Nazareth and he tied him to the whipping post. And with 40 lashes, save one, with that whip, that cat of nine tails, as it was called, he tore through the torso of the Lord's body. He brought the Lord to the brink of death, but then they stripped him of his remaining clothes. I'll read from the scripture. And they stripped the Lord, put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and they mocked him. They said, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they spit on him and they took the reed and smote him in the head, driving that crown of thorns deep into his brow. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him, stripping him of all of the scab that had already now grown. And they put his own raiment back on him. They led him away to be crucified. And then they laid him down on that transom. And they began to drive nails into his hands. And then, and then they put the other beam there. And they drove nails into his feet. And then they lifted him up and plunged him into the earth. And after hours and hours of agony, Jesus finally at the very end, he looked up and said, Father, into your hands. I commit my spirit and that he hung his head and gave up the ghost and it was over and a soldier stood by ready to break the Lord's legs he went up to break the Lord's legs as was his custom because they always did that just in case that the dead that was hanging on the, cro on the cross was not truly dead because the only way for someone to live on a cross was to breathe and the one who hung there had to pull themselves up by the nails that were in their hands and then exhale and then their bodies would collapse and then again and exhale and then their bodies would collapse. Their legs were broken because it was the design of the Romans that they would suffocate. But when the Roman soldier came to break the Lord's legs, 
He fulfilled the prophet's voice in the Old Testament that not one bone would be broken. And though his customs was to break the Lord's legs, he saw that Jesus had died. So instead, he took his big spear and he drove it through the Lord's side. And whatever blood that was left flowed out of the Lord's side and water flowed out of the Lord's side and it spilled on the ground and now truly it was over. There was no more blood and all the water had left the Lord's body. He looked like a skeleton, just ripped from head to toe. Blood covered his skin, whatever was left there. And then they, they took him down from the cross and they took 75 pounds of, of spices and they wrapped up his body. Those days of physical abuse and then the crucifixion itself, the scourging, there was no doubt in anyone's mind that Jesus was dead. He was gone. So he could have been in that grave one solitary day in that tomb. One day alone, it would have been enough. One day was enough to declare that he was dead and now he got up again. The resurrection did not take three days. One day would have been enough. One day would have been sufficient to rejoice that our Savior died and he rose again. He died and he rose again because no one was in doubt that Jesus had died. No more fluid in his body. Everything just spilled out on the ground. No more life in his lungs. Everything was gone. He gave up the ghost. They all knew it. One day would have been enough. Two days, well, that would have been more than enough. Jesus could have been wrapped up head to toe, laid in a borrowed tomb for two days, and it would have been more than enough for the world to know that indeed the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God, has taken away the sins of mankind. That all we have to do today is just say, Lord, forgive me. And he is faithful to forgive us. Because what the blood of a lamb and a goat and a turtle dove and an oxen couldn't do for you and me, Jesus did it on the cross. He is the Lamb that removes the sins from all the world. John the Baptist looked at Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. They crucified him on the Passover. They were all bringing their own lambs on the Passover to, to sacrifice their own lambs that day. Little did they know that the Lamb of God, the precious Lamb of God, with the spotless blood, was about to redeem everybody. Now, no longer do we have to have some kind of physical lamb because you have Jesus. And all you have to do today is they say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Here's the gospel. The gospel is the death and the burial. The death is our repentance. I, I have to say, I'm dying. I'm, I'm dying to that old nature. I am going to say, Lord, I, 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 I repent of my sins. Would you forgive me? And in a moment, we are covered by the blood of Jesus. And then we are buried in water, just like Jesus was baptized in the waters of baptism. We're buried with Jesus. Paul said it like this. Just as Jesus was buried, even so we ought to be baptized. Peter wrote, just as Noah was saved by water, even so baptism saves us. And there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the apostle said to the church, if that spirit is in you that raised up the body of Jesus Christ, that same spirit is going to raise you up. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He could have done that in two days, and it would have been enough for the world to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. We would have known, surely, that indeed he alone had the power to lay down his life and to take it up again one or two days. But the Lord said in John 2, 19, destroy this temple. They thought he was talking about their temple, Herod's temple. He said, no, you destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it back again. In Matthew 12, 40, Jesus said, just like Jonah had been swallowed up in the belly of a whale, so the Son of Man will be three days, and then he's going to get back up. He's going to be in the heart of the earth. It could have been one or it could have been two, but the precedent had been set long ago. Jesus was not just rising from the grave, ladies and gentlemen. He didn't just get up in the resurrection, but he was getting up with power over the enemy that afflicts your soul and mine. 
He got up with possession. He got up saying, three-day journey, I'm going to take ownership. I'm going to transfer the rights. It's long enough. I'm taking ownership. I'm taking everybody back that the enemy has stolen from me. Clap your hands unto the Lord. He took a three-day journey. Yeah. I'll read it the way the revelator wrote it. He said, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about with paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like a defined brass, as if they'd been burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, fear not, I am the first and I am the last. I am he, hear it, I am he that liveth. And I was dead. I lived and I died. But behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys. I didn't just go to the grave. I had some things I had to do. And after that three days, there'd be no doubt that Jesus had died and he rose again. But the three days was enough time to transfer the ownership. <laughs> At his resurrection, after three days was accomplished, death was swallowed up in victory. And the grave lost its grip on you and me. Satan lost his control. <laughs> All the holdings that he had. I'm going to tell you right now, because he lives, you can be set free of anything that you're bound with today. There are, there are no addictions. There's no heart, pain heart. There's no rejection. There's no abuse that the Lord can set your mind free. There's nothing that you're dealing with right now. He has all the power over everything that afflicts you and me right now here today. Paul told the church at Rome, he said, if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, you don't belong to the devil anymore. You don't belong to the world anymore. Whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. Whether you live or whether you die, when you give your heart to God, you belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and he returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Three days. A three-day journey in that grave was far enough away to transfer something and there will be no doubt when it happens in your life that it was the Lord. Three days. Jesus said it this way. He said, go ye, tell that fox. Tell him. I cast out devils. I cure people. And the third day, I'll be perfected. <laughs> Man, we've never seen perfection like what happens on the third day. On a third day journey, the Lord was looking at you. He was remembering you. He had you in his mind. And on the third day, he got up from the grave. Not because he couldn't get up on the first day or after the second day. But on the third day, there was a trace all the way back to two men who had a dispute. And one man said, listen, a three-day journey is going to dictate that stuff belongs to me and this stuff belongs to you. And Jacob said, that sounds good because I want to keep everything that I have. And on the third day, Jesus got up and said, I'll tell you what. I didn't just get up from the grave, but I got up with possession. I'm taking authority over everything. Everything, everything belongs to me. I've got all power in heaven and earth. I want to speak to somebody here. 
I don't know who you are, but I want to speak to you. In fact, you might not even be in this building. You might be watching me online, but you're struggling with an addiction. And you're thinking that it's a vile thing, and you've called it a demon. That's a common thing. The Lord has all power over that. He already has authority over all that. And you are not helpless because you're hearing the right message. He didn't get up just one day. He got up on the third day because he's going to take possession and set you free. I want to say to somebody, you've been struggling with a demon. It's addicting. It grips you. But the Lord is good. And the Lord had you in mind. And the Lord got up from the grave on the third day just to say, I've been on a journey. I got the deliverance in my hands for your life. And the devil can't have you. Oh, I want somebody to know today, you can be set free. The Lord is here to set you free. I'd like to speak to some church folks that are almost there but not yet. And the enemy has told you, it's okay to worship, just stay close to home. You're bound, but, but you don't really want to admit it. Pharaoh has said, listen, it's okay, have your li li little religious practice, but don't get too far away from my grip. I'll let you have a small experience, but don't go too far away. Hear me, if you get far enough away from that thing, You'll find out what real freedom is about. And you won't be able to stay out of the altar. You won't be able to stay out of the prayer room. Your voice will get hoarse just from praising God because it's time for the church to be set free also. It's the moment today that you are also set free. So it doesn't matter. If you're just brand new, if you're just a guest, or if you've been in the church for a long time, I come to declare a Savior that has the keys of every locked door. He can open up every door. He can set everybody free. The Lord is going to set you free, and I want to declare it today. The devil has no hold over you. I don't want to just clap. I don't want to just go through the motions. i got to have a real move of God so I can really be resurrected. You ought to shout to God, I wish I had a few folks in here that can testify. The Lord has opened the door. Listen, I, 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 I'm, uh, I guess you all know by now. I mean, at this juncture, you all know, right? Because we got this thing called the Internet, and everybody has a camera. I remember the days when you had to get a camera and buy the film. What, what does that make me? I, re I remember we had the, a Polaroid camera. And you take the Polaroid camera, then you, 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 you just flip it around. It didn't help it. it did, the, the picture was not, didn't come into play. You still had to wait. But, you know, for people like me. <laughs> and then suddenly it started coming to focus. And there we are. You couldn't take a selfie with a 35 uh, camera. Polaroid, you couldn't take a selfie. You had to have someone take the picture for you. We went to an amusement park and said, would you, to the, to the guy, he was working, working the lines. It was, we, went, we went to the amusement park. We were waiting to get inside. He handed the camera, take a picture of our family. He's so funny, he took four or five pictures of himself and handed the camera back to us, had the phone back. I can remember us, we still have tubs of, of, of photographs at our house and we've got all the kids and then we got miscellaneous and people that we love and people what we that we used to no that's not, that's not true partly but not not really no okay maybe a little somewhere in there Here's, 
I can remember doing that. I, I remember. So, but today, your phone, everyone's walking around with a camera. You can't get away. You can't be obscure. So when the banker calls me and says, Pastor, I got three extra tickets to the ball game. I said, that sounds good. Me and Nico grabbed Jackson we're to the ball game. I didn't know. By now, you all know. You got it right. You know. We're at the ball game. Everyone's there. All the people are there. Come down second row. Man, this is so great. Didn't pay a dime. All my friends. Here's Roman's way up in the bleacher section. Got a nosebleed. Roman. We're watching the game. It sounds so good. They bring the pot. Got the popcorn. And Nico says, look, Dad. Look, see? There's the ESPN guys. I said, really? He said, yes, you're on, you're on ESPN. I'm looking. See, I know you were watching because you all took pictures of that, and then my phone was blowing up. Look, Pastor, you're ESPN famous. I just, so I just, we all know by now, okay, just get over it. I don't need any more of that. We got the picture. I, I got it. We got, we got the picture. I'm looking at all those people. My mind just thinking, man, this is all so temporary. A huge stadium of people. I wonder who's bound. Everybody needs Jesus in this house. I'm looking at all the people up in the bleachers and down. And, and they... They are anticipating, and our team was losing most of the game. And of course, I lowered my expectations and said, we're probably going to lose, Nico. We're, we're losing. We're, he, I can see the scores. We're, we're losing, Nico. We're going to lose. Because I wanted to go out with, without having put too much hope that we were going to win. So I just kept saying, you know, I think it's over. I turned to the banker and said, I don't, I don't think we're doing very good, are we? He said, hold on, Pastor. He's, he's got faith. He even said at one time, I think we're coming back. I said, I don't know. We're down eight. I'm really pessimistic. I'm a downer. And, and, and they, they tied up the game, and then all of a sudden, I think, maybe, maybe. I went from no to maybe. And then we're ahead, and the crowd goes crazy. People lose themselves for a moment that didn't matter they lost themselves they forgot their status they forgot who they were and when you walked out you weren't any better than when you walked in you might have been a little poorer but you weren't any better I just want to say today I want to lose myself for the one who got up from the grave, who set me free. I don't care what anybody thinks about me today. He's my deliverer. He's my, he's my high tower. He's my refuge. He's my savior. He sets me free. He has delivered me. He has resurrected because he lives, I can live. I just want to say that if you spent five minutes clapping your hands and if you spent five minutes rejoicing over something that's temporal, you should spend the rest of your life rejoicing over a king who's a resurrected savior. And you should thank him. watching today. If you would like to help us continue to deliver content around the world online, please consider making a donation. Head to newlifeterahoe.com and choose the giving option that works best for you. Have a great day.